Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 149, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And yeah, today we got quite a few things, so let's get cracking. As usual, the first section is getting started. We got seven articles here today, uh, including an intro to server sent events, a pretty nice deep dive into the server sent events. If you never heard about those, make sure to check this one out. The next one is Noise Planets, a really nice drawing tutorial, I guess, on drawing basically noise planets. It's a pretty nice introduction to uh, drawing in JavaScript in general, so if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Next one is a mostly complete guide to error handling in JavaScript, which I think is pretty self-descriptive. Next one is Create Your Own Compiler, which is a super nice tutorial on building your compiler that is also pretty much completely interactive. So you, you will basically be creating the compiler in a browser, which is super nice. So if you were interested in the topic, make sure to definitely check this one out. Next one is creating a database from scratch with Node.js. This is a set of articles that basically walks you through building your own database using Node.js and file system and everything. Very nice one. So if you're interested in databases, make sure to check this one out. Next one is using Node.js with Docker and Docker Compose to improve developer experience. I would say the developer experience part is, well, arguable basically, but it is a nice introduction to using Node.js with Docker and Docker Compose. So do make sure to check it out if you are getting into Docker. Right, and the last thing we got here is advanced promise patterns, promise memoization. And this is just as it says, basically deep dive into how do you actually memoize the functions that return a promises? How do you deal with race conditions and stuff like this? So if you were confused about that, do check this one out. That covers the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news. We got three things here today, starting with an additional non-backtracking regexp engine in V8. It's a new write-up from the V8 team talking about the new V8, uh, sorry, the new engine, regular expression engine in V8 that is for now experimental and non-backtracking, which means it basically guarantees the linear execution in time with respect to the size of the subject string, which uh, is gonna bring some major performance improvements on the larger data sets, which is absolutely incredible. The article is pretty big and has some uh, in-depth technical details as usual, so make sure to check this one out if you are interested in the topic. Next article we got here is improving cross-browser testing part two, new automation features in Firefox Nightly. This is essentially a blog post that talks about how the people in Mozilla, people behind the Firefox essentially, did so that you can just take Firefox and use it without any modifications with Google's Puppeteer or Selenium 4, which is absolutely mind blowing and really cool. So if you're interested in details, do make sure to read it. Uh, There's some really cool stuff in here. Okay. Last thing we got here for today in the article section is Deno in 2020. This is a pretty large write up on just about everything that happened in Deno world for the last year and specifically with the Deno itself, not like libraries and anything, you know, so the engine. And uh, yeah, there's some really cool stuff here. And you know, as someone who tracks it basically is, is really fascinating to see all of that summed up because it's just been a year, but there's been so many changes is just crazy. I'm quite excited to see where the Deno goes. Again, you know, my biggest problem right now is incompatibility with the modules, but uh, lately I've been thinking, you know, the Deno uses the URL imports uh, for the modules and we are basically getting, or I guess people starting to migrate to AES modules in Node.js right now because they're finally supported everywhere. And as we discussed the last podcast, um, Mr. Sindrosaurus saying he's gonna migrate all his existing Node modules to ES modules in, 2021, right? Which means that a lot of them will suddenly just become compatible with Deno, unless they're obviously used node specific APIs, which again, Deno polyfills some of them. But the more more interesting thing is that uh, there was a proposal, we looked at the pull request, I think it was, that adds the support to Node.js to for importing the ES modules as URLs, the same way that Deno does. Uh, and I, like, I would be very interested to see how all of that develops and what we will get in the end. But it seems like Node and Deno sort of, you know, converging towards each other. Obviously, the things like file system API and everything else would be slightly different. But I'm guessing making polyfills for those wouldn't be too hard at one point. But anyway, excited for Deno future. If you are interested in what happened to Deno in last year, absolutely do give it a read. There's some really cool stuff in there. Oh, and there's also a Deno survey 
can basically help uh, the team figure out where to go from here on. It's pretty short, like 25 questions or something. So do answer it, please, if you are even slightly interested in data, basically. Right, that's it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. We got uh, quite a few of them here today, which is kind of cool. Oh, wait, <laughs> did I screw up? Get ready for ASM is actually this week's thing. Okay, well, um, I already spoiled it a bit. But anyway, let's go to from the from the beginning. So the first article here is Mosmer 1.0 can run WebAssembly universal binaries on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, Android and iOS. So we already talked about Vasmer a couple of times and uh, it's a really nice runtime. They basically provide some pretty cool features. Now they are releasing version 1.0 or I guess they already released it by now. And uh, it allows you to run the WebAssembly binaries or you know the WebAssembly programs essentially that are written for Vasmer on just about any platform, including mobile platforms, which is kind of crazy. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of fascinating to see how WebAssembly develops and just basically detaches from the browser where it was born and uh, evolves into this universal platform that can, that can basically run anything, which is, I'm really curious to see how this will go beyond 1.0. But uh, if you are interested, do absolutely check this one out. There's a bunch of links here to uh, different Vasmer websites, uh, announcements, embedded programming, and so on and so forth. Okay, next thing is ECMAScript proposal import assertions. Uh, this is the one of the proposals that is in the later stages. I believe this one is stage three right now. And this is a deep dive into it. So if you are curious, do check this one out. It's a very good, um, does a very good job at explaining what it is and how it works. Again, it's from the Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. So, you know, uh, his stuff is pretty pretty good. So do check this one out. Okay, next thing we got here is state of JS 2020. This is basically a result for the state of JS survey. Nothing super surprising here. But if you are interested in the current state of JavaScript, do absolutely check this one out. There's like a ton of categories and everything. Some of them are a bit arguable, let's put it this way, I would not exclude some of the things that they excluded or include some of the things they missed. But you know, this is all subjective. So take it with a grain of salt, basically. Right, next one is the article that I already talked about. So this is an announcement from Mr. Sindrosaurus uh, that he will be migrating all of his Node.js modules to ESM as soon as the Node 12 uh, basically node 10 goes end of life, which is April 2021, right? So as soon as the node 10 will be end of life, we'll get the lowest node, node LTS node 12, which does support ESM, which means you can safely write ESM modules and ship them for Node.js, which is uh, really cool. So this is a pretty big move and a pretty big, uh, it's going to be a pretty big shift, right? Because I'm honestly curious to see how this works out because you cannot use as far at least as far as I know, you cannot use pure ESM modules from the common JS right now, right? You have to precompile them and then uh, basically use the package exports clause to export the common JS thing. And as far as I understand, he's not going to be releasing polyfills or whatever, it's going to be pure ESM. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna be very curious to see how this works out. I mean, I really like the ES modules themselves. But um, my numerous tries of using them in Node.js right now resulted in some things that I basically had to either work around in a very hacky ways that I didn't like or just straight up not working because there were like the, some of the modules just don't work that well with ESM uh, because they try to import JSON, for example, internally, right? And this is something you cannot do in ESM. So there's caveats. I'm curious to see how that will develop, but it's a really nice, uh, it's really cool to see this happen, basically. Let's put it this way. I honestly thought it would take longer than that for people to start migrating to ESM in Node.js. Anyway, continuing, we got this uh, tweet from, uh, again, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier on uh, new module slash mode specifiers in Node.js. So it turns out it's not limited to FS slash promises, which is something I've known for quite some time. But there is apparently stream slash promises that is available in node 15 and later and assert slash strict, which is also available in node 15 and later. So if you uh, ever wanted to work with file system and or streams using promises, you can actually do that and you know, use a sync and everything and they are now baked into node, which is uh, super cool. So do check it out. 
Right, so last thing we got here is the email inputs can accept multiple email addresses. This is uh, today I learned post and uh, yes, this is basically when I read that, I, I also learned that you can actually specify the multiple property on input type email to tell the input that it actually supports multiple email, email addresses in comma separated fashion. And the article basically deep dives to show how exactly does it handled, which is a really nice thing to be honest. So I didn't know that was a thing until I read that. So if you didn't know either, do make sure to check it out. There's some uh, a bit more details in there basically, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, that's it for the tips, tricks, and bit size awesomeness. Now we are coming to the releases section. We got three of them here starting with a pretty major snowpack version 3.0, which is I should really get around to trying Snowpack because it looks amazing. Um, so Snowpack is a bundler that basically modern bundler for ES modules for browsers uh, that allows you to do some crazy things. Um, they are now version three includes pre bundled streaming imports, meaning you can import any NPM package and it will be downloaded and bundled on demand, which is super cool. So no longer have to manually look up the URLs for ES modules. Um, there is now integrated build optimizations, which basically means that they are internally using ESBuild, which is the Golang compiler for JavaScript. So somebody, you know, made the compiler for JavaScript or bundler for JavaScript using Golang. And it is mind blowingly fast since it's written in the, you know, the language that is a lot closer to metal than JavaScript which is uh, pretty interesting. So I would be curious to see how that works out. Um, again, you know, I think I already said multiple times, it's really, it's really cool to see JavaScript ecosystem adopt uh, native tooling, because it tends to be a lot faster. The only question is, of course, plugins, extensibility, and all that kind of stuff, because well, Golang is statically compiled. So it's a bit hard to add things there as plugins. And like, if you take something like uh, traffic, for example, the proxy, they do have a plugin system. Uh, but the way they do it, actually, they include the Golang interpreter in the server. And when you write a plugin, they will interpret it runtime, which obviously makes it a lot slower than, you know, compiled version of it. So there's trade offs, basically. But uh, anyway, um, I'm getting sidetracked here. Yeah, Snowpack 3 looks pretty amazing. We should do a stream at it at some point and try it out. I am really curious as to how it works out. There's a bunch of other features in here. So it's like a pretty comprehensive um, list of changes. So if you are interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Node.js version 15.6, which, uh, well, adds a bunch of stuff. But my favorite one is probably random UUID implementation. So we finally got the random UUID v4 in node core. So you can use the crypto API now to generate the random UUID and you no longer have to install any third party packages, which is uh, pretty great. So there you go. There's obviously a bunch of other things. So if you are curious to check this one out. Right, and the last thing we got here for today in the releases is TypeScript version 4.2 beta. I'm not a TypeScript person, so I can't really tell you much about that. So you know, do check it out. Seems like it's adds like a rest element and tuples. So you can actually specify the rest of the whatever tuples you're using. And uh, yeah, that anyway, it's a TypeScript. So I'm not going to talk about it. If you are a TypeScript person, go check it out. You probably already did. But yeah. Okay, that's it for the releases. Now we are coming to the libs and demos. We don't really have that many of them here. But uh, there are some pretty interesting things. Starting with Omatsuri. This is the progressive web app with 12 open source front end focused tools and the app itself is open source. So if you go to omatsuri.app, you will see a bunch of tools such as triangle generators, color shade generators, gradient generators, page dividers, SVG compressors, SVG to JSX and so on and so forth, that you can just you know, click and use uh, and play around basically and select whatever the hell you want here, right. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty nicely designed, nicely made and open source if you're curious as to how that was made. Next thing we got here is jpeg.rocks, another progressive web app that is um, essentially uses WebAssembly and web workers to allow you to optimize jpegs in browser as a progressive web app. And I believe jpeg.rocks is the website. So you know, just throw in the jpeg in here, tweak the settings, tweak the quality and get the result without ever uploading the JPEG anywhere, actually. So it all happens in your browser, which is uh, super cool. Again, open source. So if you're curious how it was made, do check the source code out. Okay, continuing, we got element F define your custom elements with elegance. 
This is another wrapper for custom elements. The API seems pretty solid. If you are working with custom elements and was not happy with the default way of working with them, do check this one out. Maybe this is something you like. Continuing, we got Svelte DND Action, an action based drag and drop container for Svelte. So if you're working with Svelte and you were looking for drag and drop library, do check this one out. Looks pretty good. Uh, again, I think I've, I've been spoiled to no extent with uh, by the React DND, which is just a fantastic library. I don't think there's any competition to it, at least as of right now. But yeah, uh, this one seems pretty good as well. So if you're working with Svelte and want a DND, do check this one out. Okay, continuing, we got Progressive Web App, uh, or I guess PWA badge, badging for Progressive Web App icons like native apps. So it basically allows you to create badges with counters, uh, notifications, and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, it requires the badge API. So if it's not supported, it's not going to work. But if it is supported, then it's a very nice wrapper that basically allows you to work with badges. Uh, again, there's limitations, so it's like only Chrome uh, 81 and H84 and later are actually supported for that, and I believe Android as well. Uh, no, actually, Android is not supported. Curious. I thought the Android would surely have this implemented before the desktops, but apparently not. But anyway, if you're working with progressive web apps and you wanted to use badges, do check this one out. This seems like a pretty solid wrapper. Continuing, we got application. This is um, no code thing, I guess, platform, I'm not even sure how to call that basically allows you to create business applications without coding, builds a fully functional Node.js server side app with all your data models and a react client in less than five minutes. I'm really far away from no code scene. I know that it's pretty big right now. And a lot of people are trying to make this sort of no code uh, environments work. But I honestly have no idea about it. I'm as you might imagine, the code guy. So you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's fully open source and I believe MIT licensed if I'm no, it's Apache 2 licensed, but still quite permissive. So do check this one out. Okay, continuing we got Vino or yeah, I guess Vino is how you read that a build tool for compiling and bundling view single file components. Uh, so essentially, someone built a view bonding tool using Deno. So this is why it's Vino. Uh, and yeah, it looks pretty solid. Honestly, it's you know, if you wanted to build your view project using Deno instead of Node.js for some reason, then uh, do check this one out. It looks very, very good. Uh, and again, you know, Deno is is pretty good. Um, so yeah, continuing, we got CSS Turing machine. Oh yes, somebody made a Turing machine in CSS, and it actually works. And it's um, I don't want to talk about that. Okay, so if you if you're interested in, in, in crazy stuff like this, check this one out. But you know, just just take care of your sanity, basically. <laughs> Continuing we got turf JS. This is an amazing library. So basically, it's an advanced geospatial analysis library for browsers and Node.js. It has just about anything you might want when working with geospatial data. It's mind blowingly good. Like I've, I had to work with geospatial data maybe on two or three projects and it usually was relatively straightforward, but let me tell you doing this efficiently is not easy and doing this on a scale and doing this with like a lot of, well, okay. Some of those functions are relatively straightforward because it's just geometry, but some of them are very tricky and having a library that can do this for you can be insane. So yes, it's pretty cool. So if you're working with geospatial data, do check it out. Uh, maybe it will save you some time. And yeah, it also claims to be very fast. So there you go. All right. Last thing we got here is Altair, a beautiful feature rich GraphQL client for all platforms. Uh, as it says, you know, GraphQL client looks very nice, very slick. Uh, has a pretty, pretty lots of features, including even file uploads via GraphQL if you want any. Um, I mean, you know, I typically when I work with GraphQL, the only client I use is the, the uh, what do you call it? The development thingy that spins up automatically, basically, right? Is the, the the one that everyone uses, Apollo and all the others, basically. I forgot the name of it, but anyhow. Um, I guess the clients are pretty good for exploring the API, right? So this is something you, you want because you get the auto completion. So if you're working with GraphQL a lot to check it out, maybe this is, will be very helpful to you. Right, that's it for the libs and demos. Now we're coming to the interesting and silly stuff. We got two things here. Uh, the first one is console patterns. This is a collection of snippets that generate 
logical patterns such as different arrows, different asterisks, checkered flags, crosses, grids, whatever. It's like I'm <laughs> I honestly not sure why you would want that when there are more advanced libraries um, that, you know, can draw just about anything in the console. But hey, maybe you want a lo-fi approach, then this is uh, probably the way to go. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Also, it's not limited to the console. You actually provide your own print function so you can generate those things uh, wherever you want. Okay, last thing we got here for today is stealing your private YouTube videos one frame at a time. A really, really cool write-up from, uh, honestly, don't know the author's name. I, I believe it was da uh, David something, yeah. So this is the write-up of the vulnerability that he discovered at YouTube that allows you to literally steal the video, the private video that is not accessible to you frame by frame, which is just bonkers. Really fun to read, uh, very interesting uh, bug bounty, very cool. Uh, he was awarded a reward for it and this is a write-up, like post-mortem essentially, so it was already fixed. It's a fascinating bug and you would never think that something like this would work, but apparently it does. So if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Right, that's actually it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 149. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or uh, on bxjs.dev. If you are interested in discussing any of this, join our Discord server or just drop a comment. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's basically all I have to say for today. So thank you guys very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode and I see you next time. Bye.